Mama Let's Dance by Patricia Hermes Chapter 1 Whenever I would dream about her, i dream of her dancing. She'd be whirling into the kitchen, looking younger than Callie even, spinning round and laughing. Her arms would be held wide, inviting Callie or me to dance. Callie would run into her arms, and they'd laugh together as though they were both Callie's age, not mother and daughter. They'd keep up whirling and dancing like that, like dancers in the movies in their pretty dresses. But that's all they'd do. Mama wouldn't talk, and Callie wouldn't ask where Mama'd been or anything. And Ariel? He'd just stand and watch the way he always used to do. Me? I'm not much of a dancer. But in my head, I'd be writing the music for them, composing it, the way I've done ever since I first learned to read music in school. I often hear music welling up inside me, new music that no one else has written before. After a while, the dream would fade, the way a picture fades from a movie screen, with them getting faint, like shadows. I'd look for the place where they'd been, the way you watch the place on the screen, but they'd be gone. That would usually be when I'd wake up. Sometimes I'd find I was sitting up in bed with my arms stretched out toward them, and that feeling in my throat as though I was about to cry. Please come home, Mama. We need you. But no sound would come out. Instead, I'd lie down again and I'd feel all shaky. How could she come back laughing and dancing like that, as though what she did wasn't wrong at all? She hadn't changed any, not even in my dreams. After a while, I'd fall asleep, safe from the dream, because it never seemed to come back twice in one night. But the following night it would be back. Mama would be whirling, laughing, reaching for us. And it would always be Callie who'd go into her arms. But that was only in my night dreams. In my daydreams, I pictured her dead. She'd be in a ditch somewhere, her car turned over and she'd be crushed beneath it. Or else she'd had one of those spells she used to have when she said she felt as though she were about to faint, or fade, as she called it. At those times, she'd call us to her and she'd hold on to us tight. Callie and Ariel and me. In my daydream, I would make her really fade away, and I wouldn't stop her fading. Callie was just the opposite. In Callie's daydreams, Mama would be alive, while in her night dreams, Mama would be dead. Callie didn't call them daydreams, though. She'd just say she knows Mama's coming back. Once, she even stayed home from school, watching at the kitchen door the whole day long, because she was so sure that was the day Mama would come back. And even when Mama had been gone for six weeks, with not one single word, still Callie believed that she was coming home. At night, though, when Callie slept, then I knew that for her, too, our Mama was dead. I knew because I'd wake up and hear Callie crying in her sleep. I'd get up and sit on the side of her bed, and I'd talk to her until she was wide awake and the sad dream was gone. Because now that Mama had left us just the way Papa did, taking care of Callie was my job. Ariel had other things to do for us, but Callie, she was my job. It had been my job for all those weeks. When Mama first left, I gave her one month. I didn't say so to Callie, but I thought that at the end of a month, Mama'd be back. Everybody needs a month off now and then. I used to wake up thinking I heard her tiptoeing around, as though she had just come home and was getting ready for bed, just regular-like. But that was mostly wishes. And I was old enough to know that wishes are not the same thing as the truth. So the month had come and gone, and we were in the second month, and I knew then that she was gone for good. It was hard, though, because if people had known Mama was gone, I didn't know what they'd do. They might have tried to take Callie away from me, and Callie was all I had, Callie and Ariel. Ariel's older and quiet and a bother sometimes, so bossy to us, but I guess that's just the way boys are, especially ones who are almost grown. I love Ariel too, but Callie had always been the one I loved most. I hadn't talked to Callie about what might happen if people knew, but Ariel and I talked about it just once, 
I asked him, after Mama had been gone for a few days, if we should tell anyone, some grown-up, maybe someone like Amarius, my friend. But Ariel said just plain no. If anyone knew, Ariel said, even Amarius, then he might talk. If he talked, then the county people might find out. And then, Ariel said, who knows what might happen. What do you mean, who knows, I said. Ariel looked at me and shrugged. Ariel, what do you mean? He tossed his head so hard that his sandy hair flew away from his forehead and eyes, giving him sort of a surprised look for a minute. You know, he said, you know just as well as me. Say it, I said. He gave me one of his looks, long and hard, his gray eyes cold as a winter lake. Why do you always want everything said, he demanded. I thought of saying, for the same reason you don't want them said. But he looked sad behind his cold eyes, so I didn't. It was true, though. I had always needed things spoken out, because... Just because I did. Hidden things, not talked about, caused trouble. I had learned that one from Mama. She had so many secrets, things that made her run away in the night. But I guess that's just how it worked out for me. For Ariel, it's just the opposite. He deals with things by not talking. He kept looking at me, that angry look still there, but a scared look growing behind his eyes. He looked away then. Because they might take you away, he said softly. You and Callie too, just like they did that other time after Papa left. Separate all of us in foster homes or something. You remember? I did. Lord, yes. I won't tell, I said. Don't worry. Not anyone. Not even Amarius, Ariel said. Not anyone. Not even Amarius, I said. But then I thought, and I said, What if someone finds out by accident? What about, like, school, if a teacher calls? Nobody will call. Why would they? They might. They won't. If they do, just say Mama's out. I'll think of something, I said. Ariel picked at a hole in his jeans. Sorry you have to lie, he said. I was glad he wasn't looking, because it was hard not to smile. Ariel's so nice and honest. He has always said his prayers every night and morning on his knees. I've seen him through his doorway. He reads his Bible, too, even though nobody makes him. But he didn't know the truth about me, that if telling lies were the only way to keep us together, I'd have lied to God himself. Because if we weren't together, especially me and Callie, I thought I'd die. Some people, like Anna Tilly, my best friend in school, she's always saying things like, I'll just die, all the time. Mostly that's if Billy Hancock doesn't look at her or if she doesn't get a new dress. But that's cheap words, like my friend Amarius would say. But when I say I thought I'd die without Callie, I mean something different. I read once, in a book about a tribe of pygmies, that if one of the pygmies got sick, the others would say that the pygmy was dead. And if he got very sick, they'd say he was absolutely and completely dead. But when the pygmy really died, then they'd say that he was dead, forever. That's how I felt about Callie. If anything happened to her... I'd be dead forever. Since that day, we all took extra care to look neat and have our homework done and all so that no one would ask about us or call or anything. And since Ariel was working then after school, there was enough money for us to eat. Ariel didn't talk about money much, but when I'd ask, he'd tell me not to worry, that it would work out, we were going to be all right. There's food money, he said once. And you know yourself there's no rent. I did know. It was something Mama had said lots of times. That it was the only good thing that Papa had left her. A house that was all paid up. I used to wonder, though, why she didn't include Ariel and Callie and me as something good. Ariel worked so hard that I worried about him. Like one night, I was still awake when he came home from his job at the gas station. My bedroom's right next to the kitchen and my door was open. He didn't know I was awake watching him. I saw him come in, plop down on the kitchen chair, open up a can of soda, 
open his algebra book, and fall asleep. He fell fast asleep, without even turning one single page. He just put his head on his book on the table and went to sleep right there. I knew how important Ariel's grades were to him. He's gotten straight A since kindergarten. So I got up and went to the kitchen to wake him up. But looking at him in the chair there, he looked peaceful for the first time in a while. So I just got the quilt from the sofa and put it over him. He didn't wake up even then. But the next morning when I got up, I could see that his bed had been slept in, even though he was already gone to school. I used to wonder sometimes if Papa would ever come back. That was long ago, after Papa first ran off, but before we heard about the mining accident where he went and got himself killed. Before that happened, though, I used to daydream about what I would say to him and what he would say to me when he did come home. I learned fast, though, not to talk about it. I mentioned it to Mama once, and she almost took my head off. She turned to me fast, her hands on her hips, fingers hidden under her apron, elbows flared out. What makes you think he'll be back? She demanded, her eyes little slits in her thin face. She was always telling me how pretty she used to be, but she didn't look pretty then, glaring at me like that. I'd been sick with measles, and I'd been lying in bed hurting and itching and bored with nothing to do. When you're hurting, you feel mean sometimes. All I could think was that if Papa were there, he'd have brought something for me, things to make me feel better. Maybe a doll whose hair I could comb, or at least something to make me stop hurting and itching. Best yet, though, I knew that Papa could make me laugh. I remembered only a few things about him, but I did remember that he was always laughing and he made me laugh with him. He made Mama laugh, too. I remember him and Mama laughing and whispering on the porch on summer nights, Mama's laugh bright as though she was a child. But that had been long ago, when I was just a child, too. But that day, with Mama glaring at me, I'd only shrugged. Why? she insisted. Why do you think he'll be back? Her eyes weren't squinted up any longer, and she was looking at me with this very still look, like she was hoping for something. I didn't know what she was hoping for, and truth was, I didn't really think he would come back. I just wished it. So I said, I want him to come back, because he wouldn't be mean like you. For a minute her face got dark and cloudy, and I thought I was in big trouble. But she just came and sat on the bed and brushed my hair away from my face. Feels that bad? She said quietly. I nodded. It did feel bad. The measles and the loneliness. Her being gentle like that made it worse, because it made me feel sad for her. I discovered something that day. When you're sick and hurting yourself, it feels worse to hurt for someone else than it does at other times. But I noticed something else that day. I think it had been there all along if I'd been watching carefully, but I'd been missing it. Mama thought he'd come back too, even after all those years. I began to notice that she would sometimes stand perfectly still, listening. There might be a footstep on the porch, maybe just Ariel outside playing, or a whistle from off in the field, even a bird whistle. For a moment, she'd go still as a statue, and then her hands would go to her hair in a quick, nervous way. But it wasn't just nerves. She was trying to pretty herself up, to pat her hair into place. I'd see something else then, a look come to her face, a practiced, pretty kind of wide-eyed look, like she was waiting for him to come in, waiting to show him she was still the pretty person he left so long ago. Then, after a while, when no one came to the door, she'd go to the window and lift the curtains and look out. I'd hear her sigh, and her shoulders would kind of collapse forward, and she'd fold her arms as though hunching to protect her chest where her heart was. After a while, she'd straighten up, but almost always after that, she wouldn't turn back to face me for a little while, even if I spoke to her. It was as though she needed time to fix her face, to put on a different look, one we could all stand to live with. But all of this was long ago, when I was just six or seven or so, Papa was gone for good, and now Mama was gone too, and we'd just have to make do somehow. 
We'd have to until Mama decided to come home to us. And if she never decided she needed to do that, then Ariel and Callie and I would manage somehow. But for now, our biggest job was to make sure that nobody knew, not school, not friends, not anyone, that the three of us were all alone.